All right, I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Thanks for finding us today here in this, uh, this room. And it's a pleasure to welcome you all back, as well as our simulcast members who hopefully have remained in their same locations. Uh, I'm Jeff McDonald from the Global Institute for Water Security, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, seminar series. We thank Howard Weider and the Global Institute and also the Canada Excellence Research Chair for funding of this uh, distinguished lecture series. And today it's a great pleasure to welcome Irina Creed from Western University in London, Ontario. Irina is a CRC in Watershed Sciences, and uh, she has been at Western, I guess, since uh, completing her PhD in geography at University of Toronto in 1998. I remember this well because I was an associate editor for water resources research around that time, and two of Irene's, Irina's uh, PhD papers were submitted under, the, under my watch, I guess, the now 1996 paper and the 1998 paper, paper, both of which have been cited over 200 times, according to Google Scholar earlier today when I checked. So she's gone on to some quite uh, extreme success following uh, two really important uh, PhD papers. And it was great because it was so refreshing not to be rejecting every paper during that uh, small stint. In addition to her very large impacts, I think, in science since uh, obtaining her PhD, she's done a lot of work with uh, science leadership, particularly engagement uh, at the provincial level and internationally. She's worked a lot with Government Alberta and recently won the uh, Outstanding Achievement Award from the Alberta Sustainability Research Resource Development Corporation. Uh, among many other things, she's working in Africa uh, on an African uh, Institute, Lake uh, Naivasha study. And uh, there she won the Western University Humanitarian Award in 2011. There's a very long list of activities that go well beyond just normal rank and file teaching and research. And uh, it's such a delight to have Irina here. She's been very engaged with uh, faculty and students today. And she's going to talk this afternoon about uh, some lessons learned uh, from Alberta. Irina. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. I've had a fantastic day meeting so many of you, and you have something very special here, no doubt under the leadership of Dr. Weeder and Jeff, thank you for organizing this. This is not my rank and file research. This is what I do because I want to affect change from my science into policy. And I have to admit, that scared me a great deal. So anyone here from the School of Public Policy, I always wondered and was kind of, uh, I found it very uh, mystifying to know how you take information and, and develop policies. I now know firsthand and I'm gonna share with you my experiences. So the first thing I learned is whenever you get outside your nice comfort of your department or your university and you start working across disciplines, is language, language, language is so important. And so for the first year, when I was working with scientists and policymakers, decision makers, we realized that we were using words that we thought we all were on the same page and we completely were not. And so welcome to the wonderful world of wetland semantics. What does function mean? What does value mean? What is a benefit? And seriously, we had different scientists coming together using those words in such a different way that we were never able to really coordinate and affect change. So for this presentation, I thought I'd give you my definition. Functions are physical, chemical, or biological processes of a wetland. Benefits is a function that is significant to human interests. And value is a combination uh, of both the functions and the benefits. So to start off, we all know in Canada and the Prairie Pothole region, wetlands are being lost at a remarkable rate. Barry uh, Warner from uh, University of Water Waterloo estimated that up to 70% of the wetlands have been degraded or lost in the settled areas of Canada. So here you can see the map. The very black areas are where the highest rates of loss are. You can see in Saskatchewan that in Alberta where many of these wetlands are being lost or have been lost. So the question is why? Clement Tochner introduced a concept called, I loved it, the domestication of landscapes. And he talked about uh, what causes and drives this wetland loss could be agricultural intensification and urban development in the southern part of Ontario. And we all know these images from the northern part of Alberta, where you get the oil sands extraction occurring. So the question then becomes, what are governments to do about this? 20 years ago, some of you might still have been, hopefully not in nursery school, but definitely in, in public school, 
20 years ago, people have been starting to work on this problem. The interim wetland policy was introduced in 1993, and it was based on area, meaning if you're going to destroy a wetland of a certain area, you had to make sure that an, another wetland of a similar area was put back. So this was what the policy framework looked like. You have a proponent who comes with a proposed project. The plan is always, always, always avoid destruction of wetlands. If it's inevitable that you're going to have to have some effect on a wetland, then minimize the impacts. And only as a last resort do you compensate for those impacts. And the compensation here was, if you were to compensate on site where the wetland loss occurred, the ratio had to be 1 to 1 to 3 to 1. My government contact just last week said, Irina, it was never 1 to 1. It was always supposed to be three to one. And the reason is because we can't, we're not really good at building wetlands. And there's going to be an inevitable, inevitable failure rate of putting those uh, wetlands back on. But in practice, it did happen to be less than one and a three to one. And then other ones where you put money into a pool and agencies like Ducks Unlimited would start putting wetlands in other parts outside the watershed. In those cases, the, the ratio was anywhere from three to one to ten to one. But what in practice happened is you went from the proposed project right away to compensation. There was no avoidance, and there was no if avoidance minimize impacts. So the failure to avoid, there was a big survey that uh, some uh, people in the team that were working in Alberta surveyed people to say, why is this happening? And they said, what we found is that avoidance just doesn't seem to be an option for most permit applicants out there. They've already planned their project, it's very difficult to work around that. So basically, if you have invested a little bit of money as a, de as a developer, it's pretty hard to stop that wetland degradation from occurring. So just to give you an example, this is an era photo of part of the uh, Alberta area, 1993. And in particular, I want you to focus on the upper right part where you can see all this nice green area. 2009, you can see how much change has occurred. So a lot of uh, high, medium density residential areas coming in place. Now let's just look at that one quarter section and do some statistics. Here we see in 1993 we had 15 hectares. In 2009 we only had 6 hectares of wetlands. 57% absolute loss in area and 94% of this had no approval. So just imagine how much change is occurring on this landscape. There's no permit for it. There's no approval for it. How could this happen? So when we look at possible explanations, Sherry Clare, who did her PhD on this work from the University of Alberta, attributed it to poor planning, a certain techno-arrogance. We can build wetlands. It's not a problem. We'll figure it out, and obviously not being successful. Inadequate enforcement and compliance monitoring, as well as the fact, and this is the most important fact for today's talk, is that wetlands are undervalued. So we went from 1993, we're now in 2013. And we have just released, 9-11-2013, a wetland policy. And the goal is to conserve, restore, protect, and manage wetlands and sustain the benefits to human uh, interests that they provide. The expected policy outcomes are twofold. Wetlands of the highest value are protected no matter what, no matter where they are. They're no-go areas. Wetland functions are conserved and restored, in particular in areas where there have been high historic losses. So here we have a province with 10 million <coughs> wetlands. And so the grand challenge is we can't go out and site visit each one of these wetlands. Um, to conduct field-based assessments, we need, to, uh, we need field based expert knowledge, um, but we don't possess this knowledge at every place or at every time. A one-time site visit isn't enough. We talked a lot about today about spatial variability and temporal variability and how what a system looks like in a dry year might be very different from what it looks like in a wet year. But there's also a grand opportunity, and the grand opportunity is introduced by remote sensing technologies where we can have fast, inexpensive, standardized, covering large areas, covering multiple times, and this idea of continual improvement. As better sensors come online, we can readily input that new information into these systems. 
but they also have to be ground calibrated in order to be meaningful. So first I'm going to tell you the story basically about how we developed this wetland assessment system that would go into the new policy. The first step was to, to figure out where the wetlands were. What is the wetland inventory? So surprising maybe to some, maybe not to those in Saskatchewan, there is no inventory. There wasn't an inventory until 2012. So when I show you this wetland, some of you may think that the wetland is this open water body here. Some of you may think the boundary is over here. This is the boundary that we consider. The open water, the emergent zone, as well as the wet meadow zone is all part of the wetland that we need to do the inventory for. This is Government of Alberta's wetland inventory that they spent many years working on. You can see the province here and the different data providers. So this is Landsat, this is the Ducks Unlimited Enhanced Wetland Mapping, the Ducks Unlimited High Resolution one, the uh, Grassland Vegetation Inventory, which is based on spot. Parts of the provinces have no data, and so here we filled it in with a national topographic database. The point is we don't have a standardized inventory. Rather, it's a mosaic of many different data forms. As a result, you can have data uh, wetlands mapped at very high resolution, at 5-meter spot satellite images, at 30-meter Landsat, and at 1 to 50,000 topographic maps. So if you're coming up with a policy and you're having people like industry come and they're going to try to assess the value, can you see if it's a, a fair playing field? If you happen to be up here, the wetlands inventory might be very different than if you're in a very high data resolution. Th that creates an unfair playing field. In addition, you can see that there were different data acquisitions. So for example, uh, the data was acquired over a 10-year period from 1998 to 2009. And again, the spatial difference from less than one meter to 30 meters. This means that the minimum resolvable unit for a wetland varies over the province from 0 0.01 to one hectare. Similarly, they have different things that they're mapping. Some of you may be familiar with the Stewart and Cantrude classification system of wetlands, much more of a hydrologic focus, looking at permanent to more uh, transient wetlands. And then other ones are more interested, maybe from an ecological perspective, where they're looking at things from the bog, fence, swamp, marsh. So some of the data have some of that information or the other, never do we find both. So this is the official wetland inventory released in March 2012 and was to form the basis of this implementation of the policy. And I just want to show you the features here in red are the outline of where the wetlands are. Here we have a road going right through here. And you can see that the linear road features are being misclassified as wetlands. And in addition, you have entire wetlands that are being missed. So this is kind of one of the major issues. How can you manage something that you don't even have a proper inventory for? So we have the technology to do better, and some of the group in my uh, team have developed some other options that we are hoping to bring into the government of Alberta. Some of it's based on LiDAR technology, and this is a very simple derivation of a method, one of the methods that we've developed. Uh, John Lindsay, a former PhD student of mine, he's a prof at Guelph, has developed this program called White Box where we can map the probability of depressions on a landscape. We establish a probability de depression threshold from which we can actually map out wetlands. We combine this with aerial photograph data as well as the uh, height of vegetation from the full feature and bare featured uh, lighter and the slope and the texture from the air photos. And then we can map wetland features, including the open water. Right now, what I'm showing you is a combined emergent zone, wet meadow zone, but we have the potential even to further divide those two in the future. And, the, and also, we can identify the isolated wetlands. So here you have the wetland inventory, and this is what we're now able to produce. The reds identify those isolated wetlands and the larger ones with open water and that combined emergent zone and wet meadow zone. Just to go back to this one example to say that we're starting to kind of work towards improved inventories where you see what was there before, we are able to avoid roads and we're able to pick up some of the isolated wetlands now. So that's a backdrop to the inventory. Now let's talk about how do we actually assess the function of wetlands. 
These are the five points I want to cover today. The first one is defining a relative wetland value assessment unit. So the idea here is that you can't compare uh, apples to oranges. You can't compare wetlands from the north in the green zone in the boreal area to wetlands in the south in the prairie pothole landscape. And so what we need to do is come up with relative wetland assessment units so you're comparing oranges to oranges or apples to apples on this landscape. The ideal relative wetland value assessment as dictated to me by the government was that it had to be environmentally relevant, it had to be sensitive to the surrounding landscape, it had to be scalable in time and space, administratively efficient, and aligned with other priorities in land and resource management within the province. And finally, outcomes focused in place based. Didn't talk anything about hydrologically relevant system or an ecological system. And that, as my training, was the starting point. So we went back and did a first pass just based on the hydrologic basis. Now we've talked about a, little about a little bit in the last meeting about is topography the last thing that you should consider when defining hydrologic systems, in particular on this very complex, hydrogeologically complex landscape. But it's a starting point. So we broke it into the seven major watersheds as well as the 132 minor sub-watersheds within the province. The advantages of this kind of approach is that they're hydrologically meaningful as long as uh, you believe that the surface features can dictate some of the major uh, hydrologic proce processes. There's a small number of large ones that are roughly comparable to the Alberta land use framework. There's a larger number of smaller ones, but not too many. But the disadvantages here is that they're not ecologically relevant. So in our second pass, I talked a little bit to some of you today about the green area and the white area. Those are basically different land management uh, units in the province. And then on the right-hand side, we have the government of Alberta's natural regions. And so basically what we did was an intersection of the two. And so this map of 21 uh, potential watershed area units are defined on hydrologic systems where the dominant ecological type is, is uh, identified. So now that we have the relative wetland value assessment system, let's talk about how do we estimate abundance? How many wetlands are there? Now, I, I was asked once when I presented this to the Society of Wetland Scientists, you say that there's a very poor wetland inventory, so how can you tell me there's 70% loss? And I went, dang, I should have had an answer to that, and I didn't, but it made me think about it. How do they get this data? So what we know, and this brings in the uh, second principle, hydrologic principle, about respecting the temporal variability is that if you have wetland abundance here on the left diagram, you know it's going to oscillate and change. If you deconstruct that signal into three, you know some of it's natural climatic variability. This is the stationary signal. Some of it is uh, a non-stationary signal due to climate warming. And then you also get the whole development-induced loss. So you have to kind of know when we're talking about wetland loss, how, of, so how much of that was unavoidable and how much of that is caused by human development. So just to give you an example, this is data that we put together for Alberta. I'm just going to run through the axes first. On the far uh, y-axis is precipitation minus potential evapotranspiration. It reflects the blue and the red bars. The blue on the top means you have precipitation greater than potential evapotranspiration, and the red is less, so water surplus, water deficit. On this axis here is the lake water levels of the Beaver Hill, which is a Ramsar wetland of international significance, and it's demarcated by these points. And what you can see here are these little circles. So that as you go from dry to wet, the water level went up. You have some lag periods in here, it drops down. So you see some kind of matching and consistency with P minus PET as well as the lake levels. And here's your Pacific Decadal Oscillation signal. And you can see that that is a very important factor driving that variability, that natural variability on this landscape. What I want to point out is that at least in Ontario, and I assume maybe also in Alberta, most maps which show hydrologic features were generated in 1980. If that becomes the reference point for looking at wetland loss, you know that you weren't on average, you were actually above average. So you may be overestimating the amount of wetlands that may, may have been on that landscape. 
The point there is not to say that we shouldn't use that data, but we have to be mindful about putting it into context of the historic variability. So what I did is, with a large team of helpers, we went back from 1949 all the way to the most recent, which was in 2009 at the time, and put together air photo mosaics uh, for each of these years so that we could capture the dry to the wet and to the dry. So this is a lot of work. This was the easier one because they had um, coarser resolution air photos. When you go to 2009, there are many more of them. But one way of fi figuring out how many wetlands are out there is to go out, stitch these together, digitally manually put out where are the wet areas and come up with your inventory. Not a lot of fun. And I don't think we have time to do it, particularly not for the whole province. So one of the other ways comes from the field of limnology and this whole thing called the frequency area or the power um, area relationship. Just want to go through this with you here. And on here is the frequency of uh, wetlands and this is their area. And the blue line is basically what the natural distribution of wetlands or lakes should be. So what, if you see a deviation or a drop down, the red line should represent what that potential anthropogenic loss could be. So what we can do is basically look at the, the difference between the blue line and the red line, and we can actually come up with both a number of loss as well as an area of loss for wetlands. So this is kind of exciting. Does it work for a very simple uh, technique and see if it works for our landscape? I'm going to show it to you for three what I call sentinel watersheds. One in the green zone in Uticama, one in the transition zone, which is the Beaver Hills, and one in uh, the white zone, which is the Rocky View watershed. So here's the one at the far north. Uh, we see that we see some red lines departing from that line. And we estimate using this technique a 37% uh, number of loss and an 8% area loss of wetland. When you go to the transition zone, it's doing much better. It only has an 11% loss and a 2% in area. And if you go to the southern zone, 74%. What was that number that Barry Warner came up with, 70%? Here we have uh, you know, independent data to support that kind of rate of loss happening in the southern settled areas. 74% loss and 28% of the area. Now, Lee Foote from U of A uh, said, well, you know, this is too good to be true. It's going to vary. You have very complex, different geological systems, physiographic regions. I doubt it's going to apply across all of those different systems. So, of course, you know, curiosity, you have to go and test it. And sure enough, you can see here with the till blanket, the lacustrian, the Oloanian, the glacial fluvial, and the water bodies, they all kind of follow that kind of line. There's something here, and it's simple to use. And from that, we can now generate historical wetland losses for the province. And here in that area that I showed you in that map that Barry generated, we're getting 60 to 80% loss. If you go up in this area where the Beaver Hills, it's only 0 to 20, get more loss up here. But then way up here, a pretty remote area, you get 60 to 80%. So this isn't the perfect system, and it's not perfect because why? Go to your right-hand side. How did I generate the, the wetlands? They were from Landsat, and that's the 30-meter resolution, the poorest quality data that served in, in this whole inventory. So it's a promising technique, but it's dependent on the quality of the data that comes in that we need to be aware of. Okay, we talked about the uh, relative wetland value assessments. We talked about abundance. Now I want to move into estimating the function using indicators. And so the rules of engagement when you work in the real world is that it has to be simple. Ideally, it should represent processes or be physically based. It should be scalable. It has to be derivable from existing, and I underscore that, databases. It must be applicable to different land uses, different land covers. and I threw this one in, it has to be adaptable to continual improvement of data sources and techniques because we recognize that we have a bit of a moving target and, and technology is always changing and we should be building a system that could readily receive that new information. So these are the, four, the set of four values that the government of Alberta set. One was what they called hydrologic health, also flood control, 
One was uh, water quality improvement, also referred to as pollution control. One was ecological health or biodiversity, and the, th and the fourth one was human use. And by this we mean, can a neighbor go down to their wetland and enjoy the view, or can they go fishing there? So it's not necessarily, uh, and some of it is the cultural significance. So that's how we've de defined the human use term. How did we go about defining these indicators? There are many wetland assessment systems out there. And some, some of the students in the class today mentioned new ones that I hadn't even heard of. We went through and evaluated all existing wetland assessment systems. We delved into the scientific literature. We came up with a pre preliminary set of indicators, which we then went through an, a peer review process. This is ongoing, and anybody, if any of this interests you and you want to kind of crack open the hood and see what's underneath and participate in the review, please let me know because this is, should be an open process. And finally, we came up with the final list of indicators. So this is what we started off with, just to kind of impress you that we did do, had to consider a lot. And we went through this distillation process to have a much finer scale that we can derive from data that you can just get off the shelf. So principle number three was to consider uh, the entirety of the hydrologic system at relevant scales for hydrologic processes. So sometimes it's more important to know what's in your surrounding buffer. Sometimes it's more important to know what's within your contributing area to that wetland. Sometimes it's more important to know what's happening at the regional watershed scale in terms of assessing the value or the function of a certain wetland. And so we built this nested series of hydrologic systems so that we can customize indicators to the appropriate hydrologic scale that should be uh, considered. The next one looks at the principle that we had to conserve the recharge areas. I put this in you in just to show you what the state of the art of the data off the shelf looks like. So in one watershed, we have two zones here, discharge and recharge, and this is the soil texture map. The only way or place we could get the data was from uh, the, the federal government, so it's a very coarse scale. The two indicators were to map the recharge discharge zone. Why? Because while wetlands and recharge zones have greater subsurface uh, storage potential and for soil texture, coarse texture soils allow water to infiltrate better than median or fine ones. Really simple, simple indicators. But we, again, have the technology to do better. And some of the work that um, we've been looking at is using thermal and imagery from Landsat. And so here I just want to show you this uh, cross-section of a part of the Beaver Hill subwatershed. These areas here are springs, uh, demarcated discharge zones in the black circle. So from this transect from here to here, which is A to A prime, this is the thermal index value. You can see that we can establish where the recharge zone is, the transition zone, and where a discharge zone is. And we were able to calibrate it with the existing uh, spring data. So what we're able to do is move from maps that look more like this, which are binary and very coarse, to ones that offer much more texture and utility. Principle five was that we talked about uh, conserving recharge. Now we had to conserve the storage capacity the indicators were the wetland area to the contributing area ratio, the wetland size, the amount of open water within uh, that wetland, as well as the average annual sub-zero days at the wetland. And this is just a map showing some of the water storage uh, for the Beaver Hill sub-watershed. Again, we have the technology to do better. If I think there's one data set that has really transformed the way that we do this type of research, it's LIDAR. And here you can again see the bare earth model this whole approach of being able to map wetlands here by doing a probability of, uh, of a depression by introducing a stochastic error term, looking at the probability of a depression being there and then mapping over there based on ca ground calibration of where the uh, actual open waters are. But we can also merge this with a, the, the air photo time series that I showed you. So from 1949 to uh, present, or even if you want to look at radar data, and this is what we did here was with radar data, that you look at um, a whole time series, you look at which ones were wet, mesic, or dry, and you stack them together to come up with something like this, which is a probability of water being on the landscape. So we can now look at this not just like is there water there or not, but bring in the transient nature of some of those wetlands on the surface. 
So this is an example close up. You can see how we've outlined these features and then within there look at the water permanence. Some of the people with the uh, Alberta Biodiversity Group are very interested in this because it's definitely linked to biodiversity and patterns and movement of organisms. But also, we might be able to translate this type of data into that Stewart and Cantrude class 1 to 5, which is part of legislation in some areas. So for example, you can imagine that if you have one that's always wet, that's going to be a class 5 wetland. And what we need to continue to work on is taking what the lower probabilities are, as well as looking at uh, the time series, not just once a year in terms of the, the driest period of the year in August, but looking at spring, early summer, summer, and fall to determine if it's a class one to four. So this is something that's almost like the holy grail of people working in wetlands, that if you can m come up with an automated way of mapping Stewart and Cantrude, you could have jobs for the rest of your life. So this is something that we're pursuing. Principle number six is to conserve hydrologic connectivity. And basically, the simplest approach is just to say, M, is this wetland connected within a certain distance to the surface water network? But again, we have the technology to do better. Here, I showed that permanence map. And from the ecology field, they talk about circuit scapes, uh, which I thought was a really interesting idea. I met somebody from McGill who was looking at circuit scapes and trying to apply that ecological science to hydrology. And so the idea here is that you have circuits of water uh, or connectivity throughout the landscape. And if you have v no wetland input, it's a high resistance. So any water flowing will meet uh, with high resistance. If you have something that is sometimes wet, sometimes dry, you'll have an intermediate resistance. But if you have something that is always like high uh, probability of water in it, water will flow right through there. So you can imagine how this can really inform flood control and wa water purification metrics by understanding how fast the water will move across that landscape. We also recognize that wetlands are not islands. They're not independent of what's happening around there. And so what we're trying to build into the connectivity are these feedback systems. And so here you see in blue are connected wetlands. The red are the isolated ones. And just imagine through this hypothetical example that water is flowing in the green direction. And so if we were to come up with a score, a function on connectivity, let's just say that all the isolated ones get 10 and the connected ones get 20. And if this is the wetland over here that gets removed, what is the consequence of removing that one wetland? Well, you have a new flow path. This is gone, so it just moves from here. You have a loss of connectivity. And basically, you have these ones, which were always 10. This one, which used to be connected, has dropped in value as well as this one, which has no value at this point. So the point here is that there are feedbacks when you do something on this one wetland to those that are upstream of it that we have to factor in in some of these policy outcomes. The seventh uh, principle, which was introduced uh, after the paper that uh, we published, was about the hydrologic synchronicity. And that's basically looking at how fast the water will move from the upland down and if there are kind of barriers to uh, prevent it from moving quickly. And some of the indicators are the wetlands uh, position within the regional watershed, the density of wetlands, the terrain complexity, impervious surfaces, and the proportion of riparian buffer within each of the local watersheds. So those were basically the functions that went just the, the functions that went in just to that hydrologic health, that first value system that the government gave us. The question now is, how do you combine them? And so to look at them, we have units that vary widely. Some of the range goes from, for example, values of 0 to 10,000 or 0 to 1. And so the first thing was try, trying to, to standardize the range of each of the data. So we use the T-score, which basically goes from 0 to 100 for all of the values. It's easy because 50 means it's the mean. And a difference of 10 means you're within one standard deviation of the mean. And so the only requirement is that you might have to transform the data because it requires that it's normally distributed. So in this instance, we have the functions for uh, hydrologic health or flood control. Here's your groundwater recharge, surface water storage, connectivity, synchronicity. 
And let's say they have a score, it could be 0 to 100 for simplicity, I just gave it to 0 to 10 for each of them. And so categorical data are flipped into an uh, equal interval ranking, continuous data are normalized and then scaled from 0 to 10. And for first approximation, we just give them all equal value. And the reason is because we want to adhere to this principle, and this is where some of the students were talking about hydrologic resilience. And in the paper, we talk about hydrologic resilience uh, depending upon uh, diversity of different wetland features or hydrologic functions within the landscape. And so if you can think that processes controlling each one of these should all be maintained on the landscape, it makes kind of sense. Let's just give them equal value for now. Clearly, you can imagine for the social hydrologists among you that this is highly contentious. And sometimes maybe those who um, may want to have much more surface water storage than something else, they might fight amongst themselves or discuss what should be the proper allocation. But for now, we just did it as equal weighting. And this is the kind of maps we're able to generate. So this is our hydrologic health or flood control score, the low to the high being from the uh, dark red to the intense purple here. Now, one of the things about doing these types of function-based assessments is we don't want to make mistakes and basically make sure that we don't hardwire the system to pick winners and losers. So one of the things you can think about is that people love open wetlands with lots of waterfowl. They're pretty. You can walk around them. And people don't necessarily value as much the small, transient, class one to three wetlands that have an important function, but it's actually away from the hum human settlements, and so they don't appreciate them on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we do is we look at each of the various functions and make sure that, um, you know, for example, here the recharge storage, connectivity, synchronicity, and we're not biasing it to a certain type of wetland feature. So I gave you the details under the hood for one, hydrologic health, because this was a hydrologic series. We've actually also done the same for pollution control, biodiversity, and the human uses. And I just want to compare the two for hydrologic health and water quality improvement. And I hope that you look at these maps because they're really pretty, but also because they tell you something very important. And what I see here is that basically the high, highest scores are all in this morainal area here, uh, whereas the highest scores for this one are all away from it. And what that means is that depending upon what value you think is the most important, you might be prioritizing different wetlands on the landscape. Now ideally, when I show you the ecological health, it'll fill in the rest of the hole and we can't touch any wetland anywhere, but the reality is that we have to make decisions. So the last part, which I think is the brainchild of Torsten Heben from Government of Alberta, and I, I really liked it, but it was how do you classify these wetlands to reflect the relative importance of a wetland on the landscape that combines all of these different values. So it's like a report card. Here we had the abundance. The functions are listed here. And basically, we want to assess them based on are they an A, a B, a C, or a D. They don't want to do A pluses and B minuses because they want to keep it as simple as possible. And so as you go from low to high, you go for an increase in wetland value. So the question then becomes, uh, well, before I get there, I'm going to show you this one. On this axis is the value of the lost wetland versus the value of the replacement wetland. And the idea here is A to D, A to D. If you replace um, a D with a D, you only have to do a one-to-one. -one. It's great. We don't have to do the three-to-one anymore. It's only a one-to-one -one, uh, area basis. But if you take a D or, let's say, an A and replace it with a D, it's an eight-to-one ratio now. So that means a proponent who wants to go and develop that needs to be aware that if they're taking an A wetland, it's going to cost them a lot more. So here we're talking about the trade-offs. And so... We did a simple averaging. We have to know if we should consider other options. And to give you an example here, these are the values of health, quality, carbon sequestration, which politically could not be part of this wetland. I know because we worked on it. 
It was considered too politically hot potato and so was not included, but I want it to be in there, so I put it on this table. The ecological health human use. But let's just take this again, hypothetical example. Wetland A, you look up here, nice big open water system. This one, more of a transient system. And here, the values are 5 for carbon sequestration, 10 for biodiversity, 10 for human use. You get a score of 5. In this case, it's all about the hydrologic, uh, hydrologic health, recharge area, water purification, and a little bit of carbon score of 5. Are they the same in value? Now let's substitute that one for a stormwater control pond, also considered a wetland in Edmonton. So here you can imagine hydrologic health great because it's for flooding. Um, you might have some biodiversity, some of the waterfowl that still come there, and so obviously high score for human use because you just go out in your backyard and enjoy the wetland. So the question is, should they have the same value when you're considering an A, a B, a C, or D? And then I just want to kind of throw this one in here because especially as we move up to the oil sands and especially when I showed you the stormwater pond and Bill McDowell from University of New Hampshire gave me this idea at a Gordon meeting is like, should we really be trying to manage for a mythical past where climate is changing and systems are changing or should we start shifting our paradigm to uh, what we call a designer future. And so we can make wetlands that have exceptional function that we can design. And basically that is what's starting to happen on the oil sands. Uh, Dr. Bailey and others in her team are coming up with criteria to design these wetlands. But it's, it's a philosophical issue as well as a, a political one. But getting back to how these scores work, an A category here, I'm just showing you my three sentinel watersheds, Uticama, Beaver Hills, and Rocky View. The distribution of this value score is 0 to 1 in this case. You can see hypothetical, please don't take this as literal, but very different distributions. In this case, you have much more scores around the 0.23, this one around 0.5, and this one 0.78. So the question is, how do we decide the ABCDs? This is a relative wetland assessment system. It should be relative to what exists within each of these uh, watershed units. So in this case, you can see that an A uh, in Uticama could have a very much higher score than an A down at Rocky View. This is complex, but it's so cool I had to throw it in. We applied the, um, the uh, frequency area distribution to uh, the, five, the three different sentinel watersheds, Uticama, Beaver Hills, and Rocky View. And we applied very different kind of approaches to breaking it. In this case, we did one on 10%, 90%, and everything in between was just split in two. This was the 25, 50, 75%. And this one was something using the Jenks method, which is just natural distributions within the frequency distribution. But what this kind of shows you is that if this is the, uh, the frequency area natural relationship showing some loss in these areas, you can then look if you're getting preferential loss of certain, historically, of certain classes of wetlands. So for example, here, based on the percentile method, you see that most of the loss occurred in the A and the D uh, wetland scores, um, and less so in the more northern sites. So these are kind of tools that we're looking at trying to see have we preferentially destroyed certain classes of wetlands on the landscape? So we talked about uh, what do we do about trade-offs within various functions, various values. And now the biggest concern by many of the environmental groups in Alberta is trade-offs among regions. So you can imagine in the green zone where there's a lot of resource extraction, if they destroy wetlands and the priority is that we should restore and conserve in areas where there's the greatest loss, that you could be seeing an export of wetlands from the north to the south. And so the issue is, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? So this is God deciding. And I don't know who God is right now, to tell you the truth, but there has to be some system in place to decide are we going to be treating the indicators equally, the functions equally? If there's trade-offs to be made, who's going to make it? The one thing I can tell you is that the policy is, and this is the clever part that I, I think that the group have come up with, is that what you didn't see in the um, flood control, the, the pollution control, the biodiversity and human use was anything to do about abundance. 
And so what they're talking about doing now is using that as the turning off. So if you have an A, B, C, D in certain thresholds, and all of a sudden you have 70% wetland loss, we're going to crank that A way down. So basically everything becomes an A, for example, in the south. So that's one of the levers that they're trying to use in order to minimize the kind of loss that can occur. So just to exemplify over here, in the top, we have this distribution of A, B, C, D for the Uticama one. We've had about 36% wetland loss and 60% and on the landscape. However, if you move down here, you can see many, much fewer A and greater proportion of the C and Ds you've only had about 10% loss. But down here you have those A, but you've had 74%. So basically, they're going to make A, B, and part of C all an A score. They're going to reclassify it to make sure that you don't get further loss. So the wetland policy, all that I've showed you today is just to deal with that avoid. That first thing that I showed you about the interim wetland policy, which everything went straight to compensation, this is all to inform the avoidance. If you put a high enough price tag on it, the idea is that people will be much more careful about which wetlands that they will develop. However, it's inevitable that development will go on. And so if a proponent decides, I accept the price tag, I'm going to minimize impacts, but I still have to replace because I'm going to be removing wetlands, we have to not rely just on this very coarse functional assessment system, but do uh, on-the-ground site-based assessments. And so a parallel initiative that's been going on is developing such a tool for site-based assessments um, in, the, in Alberta. It's called WESPAB for now, and we're looking at a modification of this to apply uh, for the policy. So my last slide, Winston Churchill said, never, never, never give up. That applies to many of you graduate students as well. But this took 20 years in the making. And I have to be honest with you, last summer when we had submitted it and it went to cabinet, we thought it was dead in the water. And it was quite a surprise to get that September 11th announcement that uh, it's gone and it's approved and will be implemented within the next six months for the white film. So thanks. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much, Arina, for really an exceptional talk. I think we've got some, some time for questions, comments. Jay? Oh, it's a wonderful presentation. <laughs> I think I will learn a lot from, <laughs> from you, I hope. So I have like a couple of questions. So, so first question connected to the data. To the what? Data, information. So uh, uh, when we download data from Canadian uh, Water Survey, from GeoBase, for example, uh, and metadata actually shows that a lot of data were extracted from Landsat to 2000 and from topographic maps. So uh, anyway, uh, when we use current data, I mean, uh, uh, LiDAR data and so on, we will have this big difference what was extracted before and what we are doing now because of time difference and so on. And as far as understood, you use uh, four type of DM, one from LiDAR and next from uh, SRTM shuttle and next radar and next group like uh, DM from topographic maps. And we don't have LiDAR for many areas, just for very small areas. And we have four different type of DM. Did you compare all these uh, four different type of DM and you show some uncertainty analysis and error level and so on? Very, very good question. We had a proposal to do that. They didn't want to fund it. A year ago, they said, use what's on the shelf. And so we used what was on the shelf. As a scientist, though, we are doing those types of benchmarking techniques. So I think they now recognize the critical importance because from my perspective, it's an unfair playing field for proponents on the landscape. It just happens to be under which uh, quality of wetland inventory are you operating, you might get very different rules. And so what I proposed to the government last week was that what we need to do is come up with an uncertainty map for the entire province. We can't change the deadline that we have to have something that goes into play in six months. That's, that's not movable. But what we can do is say, 
this is a continually improving product, that these are the areas where there's high uncertainty in data. If you still want to go there and work in that area, be aware that when you go from the planning to the on-site assessment, there might be discrepancies. And now when, when they realize that, they have to look at the legal implications of proponents going there and the rules changing. So this is a really important issue. But from my perspective, I can let them know up front. And what it also does is identify the potential priorities of government for where they have to go, the hotspot areas of poor data that they have to improve. That's the best that we could do at this point. Good, thanks. Naveed, then Howard. Yeah. Or sorry, Ali, then Howard. So Jay actually asked my first part of the question about the uncertainty in the space, the next <laughs> but uh, yeah. next part is actually uncertainty in time because we have seasonal variability. You show we have interannual variability, and we have these photos that, or the, the basically the, the maps of the wetland that are actually subject to a certain time. These photos are taken in certain times, so basically you cannot see the seasonal variation or perhaps even finer, uh, you know, variation in the wetlands, perhaps areas and all that. So how you can actually address the uncertainty regarding that temporal uncertainty? Well, you can't base it on open water alone, number mm -hmm. one, because that's what you're basically mapping in many of the time series. You have to look at the potential limit of the, of the wetlands, and we do that at, at the simplest approach by defining it based on topographic features. But one um, postdoc I had, uh, Yasir Cahill, used very sophisticated uh, machine language training to combine all data of various scales to come up with basically the wetland that included the wet meadow zone, the emergent zone, and the open water. I already suggested it to one student who's going to look at that paper, but it's on my website if you want to learn more about that. Uh, for, so basically, I, anything I tell you, there's a simple answer, and maybe there's a more appropriate answer. Mm -hmm. The simple answer is recognize that you have to accept the wetland area as is. An intermediate answer might be try to combine data fusion with LIDAR and the air photo. The most sophisticated one would be using um, all of the data sources to use machine learning languages to come up with the optimal boundary. We found that that worked quite well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Howard. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, it's um, an important issue, and it's really uh, nice to see a major step forward in the regulatory framework. Um, I was struck by uh, the, you didn't talk much about award quality, but you showed that really interesting slide where you've got complementary functionality. Um, so the areas that were good for water quality were bad for hydrology, vice versa, less good. Um, could you discuss that a little bit? Because I found that surprising. You'd think there'd be some commonality um, in terms of retention and, hen I mean, if, if I'm, I'm not for sure. Recharge and, and for yeah. Removement, um, yeah. especially pollutants. So, and, and what are you thinking of in terms of pollutants? So th this is my one area that I'm worried about the most, and I'll <coughs> tell you why. Um, when they did the water quality indicators, they came up with one indicator for all of pollution mm. control, and it was mostly focused on nutrient management. So we know that the behavior of nitrogen and phosphorus are driven from very different processes. But we kind of had to combine them into one score because the government didn't separate them. So last week, I raised that very issue, saying we've got conflicting functions that we have to come up with a score for. And the outcome was, their advice, was that we should focus only on phosphorus for now. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of those who recognize the importance of nitrogen as a major pollutant, uh, is, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But for now, we're going to redo that uh, pollution control one and basically do it individually for phosphorus. If we have time, we will deliver another product for nitrogen, but at a minimum, kind of deconstruct what is entailed within that water quality improvement. Mm -hmm. And what was the explanation for the difference between the two, the difference in functionality? So if you have uh, saturated areas where you get reducing conditions, nitrogen moves through it, it will go off to the atmosphere. If you have phosphorus that's tied on to organic matter and reducing conditions, it releases phosphorus to go into the surface waters. Okay, but you still have some detention function within the wetland. Within which, the wetland. So we're looking yeah. at what goes into the wetland itself. Yeah. So that's how the value is, is, is uh, that's the limit of what we were able to do. With but in terms of downstream impacts, yeah. then it could be beneficial simply to have that retention function for water quality, I mean. Yeah. I ha 
I'd have to go back and look at that, yeah. Howard, to, to give mm. you an answer with confidence. Yeah. Because we did look at the connectivity as well and the movement through that. Mm. But we were handicapped in the beginning because of having to put in for an overall uh, metric for water quality, mm -hmm. which I was never satisfied and will be definitely improving. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if I'm allowed a brief second question. <coughs> um, uh, the implementation of this is interesting because I think there's, I don't know, the, anecdotally there's a lot of drainage, well you said I think yourself, there's a lot of drainage that goes on that's an unregulated, so is this a magic wand that's going to make things better or are people just going to carry on doing um, drainage as they see fit without going through regulatory process? Or? So one of the other things that the government has decided to do, it's, it's like running a, a, a country. Before, the power was left to the distributed uh, site approval uh, officers. So if they made a decision, and often under pressure by a proponent because they've invested money, they made the decision of whether something would be developed or not. But there was no data record often. There was no centralized capacity. So what the government now wants to do is be the coordinating body so that all uh, plan planning goes through that coordinating body in terms of quality control. And if someone goes down to the site assessment level and a proponent gives money, it has to go back to that central coordinating body. The advantage is not that they want to control everything, there's a lot of work, but that you have information flowing. Mm -hmm. So when you do the site assessment, if you find on the site that uh, the m numbers that you're generating are not in accordance with what the planning tool is telling you, that information goes back to the coordinating body and then is used as a feedback to improve the planning tool. But it also means that the government won't allow an approval to occur until empirical evidence on the ground has been done due diligence to ensure that that wetland should be developed and if so, what the cost should be for it. Would that apply to land, agricultural land management change? Would that ap apply to agricultural land management change? It's applying to the whole province. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, let's see how first one goes. Use the mic if you can, just so the uh, simulcast viewers can, uh, can hear. Well, the first question goes to the agricultural land management, that if you were to return those agricultural land classes back to, say, prairie grasslands, all right, even John Pomeroy made this common once, that you would lose the amount of, like, of water that would be going to the wetlands. So it could be a case that these wetlands that you're seeing in the southern provinces are due to anthropogenic changes from the early or late 1800s as opposed to being natural wetlands. So if a farmer wants to say, I'm not going to grow corn anymore or wheat or whatever and put to natural prairie lands, those wetlands will now disappear. But now you're saying that he has to then make new wetlands to compensate for that, even though he's returning it to the natural state. I think that there are safeguards within that system because there's other things with natural uh, landscapes with biodiversity and other mm -hmm. parts of that value system that would increase the value of that. But um, those, those kind of uh, outcomes are not really the intent. It's if you're going in there to put in a building or a home that's mm -hmm. really the intent. Well, that's what I just meant though, is how many, like those wetlands, how do you know that they were natural and not artificially created from land class change in the last hundred years? when you did the delineation. Um, we don't, because that data doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. The earliest records that we found were 19... 40s. Actually, we found some in the 1920s, mm -hmm. but 1940s is, is the one that we had greater coverage, and certainly not for the whole province. And then the last question, I guess, for in the boreal forests, um, a great percentage of it is treed wetlands in which the water isn't at the surface. So how do you delineate the wetlands that are peatlands? That's one of the biggest challenges that we face for the next year. This year, August, the, is for the white zone. A year from now is for the green zone. And one of the scariest things is that when you look at the Canadian wetland inventory, how they demarcate those wetlands, there are like one that I would map out as a single wetland complex, and they have like maybe 50 wetlands within there. And uh, I think that there's going to have to be, um, within over the next year as we move from the white to the green zone, the brightest minds uh, come together to figure out what kind of uh, realistic function indicators we can do for that area. That's a big, big challenge. Students from class, any questions? Yeah. <coughs> so you mentioned there was a, nice talk by the way, uh, there was a concurrent field element to this program in addition to what you, I guess, were creating. So I'm wondering, 
has there been an accuracy assessment or how are those two tying together? Oh, yeah, excellent question. <laughs> Admittedly, one of my frustrations was that these were done in parallel and not in a coordinated way because I felt that if we're building a planning tool um, and we have different uh, fundamental logic underlying it, we're not going to be in concordance. And so when this goes out, you're going to have a lot of discrepancies and you just don't want to be there when that happens. So what has happened as of last week is that we're now the, what I call the off and the on, those doing the remote methods versus those doing the site-based methods are now allowed to talk to each other. Previously they were not. And so we, that's why I said the prototype for the West Fab was developed and uh, we now have to kind of open the hoods on both to see what is the best, and, and this is where the site-based method uh, did do it specifically for phosphorus and nitrogen, sediment, temperature, and carbon sequestration. So they had done, it was really coming from the US and the state of Oregon has adopted this whole method. So right now over the next uh, beginning part of the next six month window will be to do the conceptual uh, mapping between the two tools, do some refinement of it, and then uh, put that out. Now that addresses one question, which is about how the two combine. It doesn't address the issue of how do you know if they both kind of match now, but for the wrong reasons. And so validation of these tools is one, you know, I was told that it was rarely done, some of these wetland assessment tools. It's rarely validated on the ground. You, from your American experience, may tell me differently, but Americans have told me that it's not validated. Yeah, it's not. So I don't, li I don't like that. And so what we're trying to do is come up with, uh, in the longer term, not obviously in the next six months, but maybe by a five-year uh, point check, is to come up with you know, innovations in some of the satellite to come up with independent measures that could be used to test it. So from the satellite end down or from the top down and as well as from the bottom up to look at different more comprehensive site-based data, empirical measurements, mass balances. You know, one of the trickiest things is doing the water quality. And the reason is because to do it properly, you need a mass balance. And anyone who's ever done anything in the field trying to look at water coming in, water coming out, biogeochemistry, that's a lot of work. That's a PhD right there. And yet we have 10 million wetlands to do it on. And so what we recognize is that there has to be much more dollars put into research and to come up with these things that could then validate some of these site-based and um, planning tools. Thanks. Good. Okay, we're just going on 505, so I think I'll uh, draw it to a close now and uh, thank you all for coming. I think for students in SENS, you know, where we're trying to do interdisciplinary research, IRENA is really a, a, a brilliant example of how interdisciplinary research works. You know, your undergrad, I think, was in zoology with a botany minor, master's in environmental science, PhD in geography, where she became a numerical modeler, GIS uh, modeler. And I think, you know, this is, uh, I think, just a wonderful example of uh, interdis interdisciplinary work at its uh, finest. So thanks very much, Irina, for a thanks. stimulating talk. Thanks. We're all going to Alexander's after, so please uh, join us for more discussions there. Thanks. Okay, thanks, everyone.